Hello everyone, my name is Franz Josef Kaiser and we'll talk about how your personal robot army lets you play the big game. Um, I know it's a bit, a, a bit of a long title. The aim is freelancers for this talk and small agencies. Um, who in here is a freelancer who works for his own? Perfect, you're all right here. Uh, quick introduction. Again, my name is Franz Josef Kaiser. I'm from Vienna in Austria. I'm moderator on, on Stack Exchange and hashtag Unser Kaiser if you want to follow me on Twitter. When we talk about developing stuff, the obviously first thing always is user experience. So when you talk to a client, what's the most important thing? User experience. When you have people interacting with your stuff is always user experience. And with user experience there come many features. And when we talk about features, then we talk about another thing. And that is developer experience. And developer experience is everything that happens that happens before user experience happens. In a way that, that you have to uh, that you have to work in features and iterate on features and the features start building up. So your originally very straight um, workflow, you start developing something, implement the feature, refine the feature, deploy the code, suddenly starts taking sidesteps. Every time a new feature comes in, the sidesteps grow bigger and bigger and bigger. And when you have more sidesteps, your development process slows down. You have less time to work on quality, you have less time to check if your code really works, and stuff gets more expensive. If stuff gets more expensive, the chance raises that the client just says, come on, why should we put that amount of money into such a small feature? I mean, it's just that little button over there. And we all know a little button can mean 100 lines of JavaScript code, 200 lines of HX callbacks on the PHP side, database queries, and so on and so on. So, the first thing you wildly will start thinking is, I will write a base class that I can use everywhere, that I can extend, that I can use in any given context. But there's another possibility where it can save a lot of your time and raise your quality. And that is your an environment. Um, who has, has a plugin that he supports somewhere, let's say on GitHub, on WP org. Another single one with a plugin. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. The first real problem is when you start co-working with someone that you can't reproduce setups. The current state of development is XAMPP. You fire it up, you get Apache, PHP, MySQL, you just install it, double click, wait for the installation, everything done. Only problem is pre-compiled, yes, but maintained per workplace. Now let's imagine you want to test a bug. You ask the user, what MySQL version do you have on your server? What PHP version are you using Nginx, Apache, and so on. You give them a simple plugin, PHP info, tell them where to find in the table the necessary information, drop it in, and you and possibly any coworker or contributor say, okay, let's jump on this and fix it. Now you have to change the Apache version or switch to Nginx. You have to change the PHP version, the MySQL version, just to try to reproduce a bug. It's something that you want to avoid at all costs. When you, when you start wrangling with your local install, it's not shared. You can 
just try to reproduce something, but then you messed up your local install. And to work around that, we have Vagrant. Vagrant is the answer to, I say, 80% of all our problems. We don't have to maintain any, any Ubuntu or CentOS or I don't know what, what, what funny environment we ever get. We can just take Vagrant, download it, install it, and then configure and provision this one box. We can take the box, put it up on GitHub, on Bitbucket, wherever we want. Everybody can pull it down and just try to work in the same environment like us. So that means we don't only share problems, we share a solution. And we're sharing that. We gain an enormous amount of time. Vagrant itself is just a Ruby package. Don't be afraid, you don't have to learn Ruby to use Vagrant. You don't even have to know any of the syntax. And Vagrant itself is just a wrapper for Oracle's virtual box. That means you install again Oracle's virtual box, it get, got a graphical user interface, and with virtual box you can how to explain this best? Um, you can bring up virtual machines on your laptop or your desktop or whatever you use. So you want to have one CentOS box on your computer to test CentOS installation. You want to have another one for Ubuntu and for whatever you can imagine. And you can host them all in parallel. You can share the setups for them. And to talk to VirtualBox, we are an easy to use interface, we use Vagrant. Vagrant box list is a very convenient statement on the command line. If you enter that, you suddenly see what boxes you have installed on your machine and ready available. Like, let's say, CentOS 5, CentOS 6, Ubuntu 12, and Ubuntu 14. And you can share all those with your colleagues. So if you have a bug, you can reproduce it. Your colleagues can reproduce it. And they can say, OK, maybe the problem is um, this or that library isn't shared on Ubuntu version 12, and we ain't got XML support for PHP 5.2. Something that has taken you an enormous amount of time, maybe half a day some years ago, is something that you can change and reproduce in 20 minutes. Biggest time saver ever. And as I said, don't be afraid. It's really, really, really easy. The next thing with Vagrant is provisioning. Provisioning means installing software, like what you did on the command line when you logged in and you said, I don't know, I need memcache and I need I don't know, varnish and put all that in, then I can easily just take a provisioner for Vagrant, that's another piece of software that sits inside of it, and install it on this single machine. We know we have a lot of boxes, we can install something on this box, not on the next box, but again on the third box, and we can try um, the same box over and over again with different PHP versions, like 5.2. Three, I guess, is the minimum for WordPress at the moment, and 5.3, and 4, and 5, and so on, and so on. We can do other funny stuff as well, like automatically upload files, and we can configure different packages, like putting uh, xdebug or xdebug uh, in it, and upload our own .ini file to configure just xdebug on one machine with a different setup on another machine. And to do that, there are an enormous amount of different provisioners. Most of them run on some sort of Ruby dialect. You can use simple shell setups or just run PHP files to provision your machine. It's all no problem. Whatever you want to choose, you can choose it and you can use it. And it's, again, not hard. The problem is, 
which one to choose. My personal uh, favorite is Puppet. Puppet is pretty much the jQuery of, of all the provisioners and for the rest it's just shell scripts like, I don't know, pull down WP test from GitHub or something like that. But we get a shortcut. Shortcut is called PuffBet and the site lives on puffbet.com and to just bundle all your stuff you go to puffbet.com, kick some buttons, choose some checkboxes and radio buttons and all the funky stuff, and then you hit download. And with download, you get one folder for Vagrant, where you have your configuration files, your Vagrant file, and you're done. As I said, you don't have to know Ruby just to get an easy way to manage different setups, to reproduce different setups. Like you got a client, he says, I got this hosting. You look at the hosting, look what is installed, what PHP version is available, and you simply build yourself a new box for this specific client where you can run everything in. If you change something or you need to change something, you can just take the YAML file, drop it, drag and drop it on PuffBet. It retakes all the settings. You just change a little setting somewhere, you download it again, you run provisioning again, and your whole box changed. Needed time? Five minutes. Yeah, um, there are three cases where the provisioning happens. So normally when you start the day, you just open the command line and hit background up, enter. Five minutes, ten minutes, depending on how big the task is. And you have a running server on your local machine. And you have the same server like all your colleagues and possibly the same server as your client. Just right in front of you. If you run background provisioning, uh, provision, then it just reloads all the configuration, builds the whole server a second time, and you're again done. So you can have a running server, change some settings somewhere, like, I don't know, um, rename a user or whatever, background provision, it reloads it, reconfigures it, and again your box is set up. And if you got all that under version control and you pushed it up into your repo and tell your colleagues, I don't know, on Slack, hey, please make a push, reprovision your boxes, they do it, and you have the exact same setup. So you really can reduce a lot of time, a lot of friction, a lot of guessing but just using background and a mechanism to configure your, your, your uh, development boxes the smart way. Yeah, coffee time. That's always the time when you hit background up or provision. If you ain't got the box installed, it could be that it pulls down a 500 megabyte image, depending on your internet connection. Like Marco told me, he can't even stream top gear in the hotel room. Forget it. Let it run in the evening, in the morning, get back, and your box is uh, ready. Next step, when, it, when we talk about um, speeding up development process, is dependencies. Everything is a dependency, and I really mean that. Even WordPress is just a dependency. Every script you want, every style sheet you want, even your own plugins are just dependencies. Stop building the one mega plugin, build 50 small plugins that you can reuse, put it in separate repos, push it up, and pull it in whenever you need it. Don't try to, to make one mega solution. This time is absolutely over. The question always is, if we got dependencies, how do we manage them? For pretty much everything, and everyone, I guess, um, our version control system is Git. Who uses SVN? Hands up. Two? Okay, I can't do <laughs> uh, Who uses Git? Who uses HG? Okay, who is, has uh, heard of HG? Two people, three, okay. Mercury. Mercury. Again, three? Three and a half. <laughs> so, um, back to Git. 
Um, GitHub modules, everyone heard of it? GitHub modules is like pulling one repository right into your repository, then detaching it. Like you just keep the remote location available, but you fix it to a single commit. Someone works on his repository and you say, I need that exactly at that state. And then you start working again and again in your repo and you push your changes up and whenever you do that, you move forward and at some point you say, hey, come on, um, this guy threw, I don't know, 200 new commits in his repo and there are definitely some things in that I, will, that I want to have for me or for my client and you start pulling it in. I'm not sure because the camera is running if I can say it like this, but then you're fucked. <laughs> First thing, don't try to version control, version control. That simply won't work. Second thing, you have to manage everything on the command line and everything yourself. Every conflict, every rebasing of pointers to tags, to branches, and so on. And the last line is the most important line, maintaining is even harder. I should even have written there, impossible. We want to manage software, not version control systems. So nowadays we got completely different things than GitHub modules. We got package managers. Okay, just imagine you don't see the answer in here. This is Composer, then the Node.js NPM, um, package manager repository thing, and Bower. Each of them have a specific task. It's not like you want to manage everything with Composer or everything with Bower. You just want to replace everything that you would have, where, where you would have used Git submodules before with one of those three. And if you do that, you can stop managing software and you will start managing workflow. Composer is a PHP written, it, ru it runs on PHP, a PHP written um, package, ma package manager with a huge repository and you can fetch resources or packages from nearly everywhere. Bitbucket, GitHub, I don't know. We mainly use it to manage core, whole WordPress as a dependency, plugins, our own plugins, plugins from third-party developers, the same goes for themes. And we can even pull stuff in like, let's say, who knows, Guzzle? Okay, um, that's a Symfony uh, wrapper for HTTP APIs. Um, next thing, NPM. This is what I call the toolbox because you won't really need it to run all your stuff, but it, it uh, will be used to fetch all the little tools and helpers that you use to, to manage your style sheets and scripts like Twitter Bootstrap and Underscore and whatever. And Bower is just there to pull all this stuff in, like Bootstrap and Angular or whatever you can imagine. Let's talk about Composer. Core plugin themes, libraries, we already mentioned that. This is the only file we need to manage our dependencies with Composer. It's called composer.json, and it lives in the, rule, uh, in, in the root of your project. The first thing is our name. It's always just key value storage, like JSON files are. Our name, then the type, that's pretty important. It's, you have different things, um, types that you can use. I'm not going into depth on that one. Just assume we'll manage one WordPress install for one client, and that's our project. The next thing is our configuration array. Bindir, that's where all our binaries that we may need on the command line will get stored, and the vendor directory. In our case, wp-content slash vendor. If you pull in Guzzle, which I just mentioned, then it will get saved there you will have Guzzle available from there. And then a lot of other stuff that you don't need right now. Most important thing, um, bin dir, the bin directory, 
just set it to EIN, like seen there, because if you hit the command line and you're on the root of your project and you want to run, I don't know, five different uh, command line tools, you don't want to have a tree that's nested, I don't know, five folders deep, and you have to type them over and over again. It's just making things a little bit faster. The second thing is we got repositories. Repositories are our pointers to the packages, like I mentioned, Bitbucket and so on and so on. I guess uh, Andreas Gritten mentioned it in his talk, the WP Packages. That's um, one resource where you can fetch or that acts as a proxy for official plugins and themes that you will find on WP.org. Let's say you want to build, uh, pull in the 2015 theme because you use it as a parent theme, then you just use WP packages. Second thing, um, HTTP rarst.net, um, he's another moderator from, from WordPress Stack Exchange. He has some nice packages like uh, meaningful um, setup for WordPress as dependency. And last but not least, you can use everything like GitHub as a source. As a source. And if the package is not set up for the usage of Composer, you just tell it, okay, type is version control system. That is a wrapper for Git and SVN and all the funny stuff. And then you just enter the URL. In this case, um, Tosho talked about the, uh, the T5 rewrite, no, just about um, WP rewrite, which is quite a mess in WordPress and hard to get your head around. T5 rewrite is one of the plugins that I always pull in because it helps me analyzing how the whole rewrite structure is built up. And then it's shopping time. Require and require dev. Every package manager nowadays has this difference. It's easy to get your head around this because require is what you require for the final product. The thing that gets shipped, distributed, deployed, that's require. Require dev is just what you need during development. In that case, need WP test, that's the uh, XML um, test data setup for WordPress where you got everything covered. And again, WP packages or WP packages slash theme or slash plugin. And you can pull just the stuff in to test in your, your install. WordPress itself is a dependency, is what I said. Amended, John B. Ploch, WordPress. This will bring us WordPress into our installation. WordPress won't be downloaded, unzipped, stuffed in our version control. This won't happen anymore when you use Composer. You suddenly removed, I don't know how, how large is WordPress core with all files nowadays? 190 megabytes? All oh, right. 100. <laughs> I was just kidding. I just wanted to hear a number. OK, let's say 5 megabytes. Now you have 200 projects. And everywhere you have WordPress. You don't want it. You want just to tell, this is the version of WordPress I require for this project, period. Last thing, or the last two things, PHP. You can um, even require a minimum PHP version, which is pretty handy. Let's say you use namespaces. You can't use them on PHP 5.2 versions. You want to use short array syntax. You can't use it with PHP 5.3 and so on. So we just say greater or equal than 5.4. And for WordPress, we use 4.1 and so on. Last thing is from Wens Lucas, php.environments. This is one I will be talking about a little bit later. Um, this is, in, in theory, the basic setup you will need. Let's go back again. Composer tracing, first part, name, configuration, second part, repositories, just the pointers, last part, what do we require? What is the stuff that we really need to install our project? And we're done. That's only one file. Next thing, and this is the first thing, and maybe the part because I, I named the talk 
something with robots. We got a scripts array. Scripts is just custom stuff that you want to run from the command line. If you run stuff on the command line, it's nice, it looks like the matrix and a little bit of hacking and all of that. What is even cooler is that you can automate it. Everything that can run on the command line can be run via Chrome scripts. Let's say, let's try to update WordPress every 50 minutes. You can do it. You just write your little script and let it run, period. And you can write the script in PHP. You don't have to know any bash or shell or any other funky syntax. You just do it. And even more nice, Composer is a little bit like Git and it offers you the possibility to hook into specific tasks it executes. Let's say we install our packages. We open the command line, hit Composer install, and the first thing that will happen is that anything, any script that is called on pre-install will run. If it finished, it will install our package, and on post-install, we'll just execute the next command. And that means you can build up a workflow. Let's say every time I need this single package, I have to, I don't know, set up test data in front. I have to clean some folders because when I install it, I have folders that I obviously will generate and I can drop them. And then we got extra data. Extra data is like command line arguments. You know, normally when you hit the command line, you have flags like dash f or dash dash uh, flags or whatever. If you need such an argument, you can as well put it into extra. In this case, the flag would be named WordPress install dir, and as I said, we got a subdirectory install, it's called wp. Yeah, um, again, to make this a little bit more visual, composer runs script foo, let's say you have defined under script, a key named foo, and a script that shall, shall run on it, and you hit composer run script foo, then we'll just execute the script, the PHP file that you have there on the command line. And you can catch all the arguments. You can catch the arguments that you self put in, or you can catch them automatically, or you can even do an, an additional step and just ask for user input. So you can build yourself a really convenient setup that is pretty fail safe. You can give yourself feedback, this happened, and that happened, and that happened. You could even lock that. So you push your stuff onto the client server, and when you're done, you can pull up your log file, where you locked everything, and see, okay, stuff worked out. Or if it didn't work out, it went until step, I don't know, five, and there it broke. So I know where, where, where my problem was, where I made the mistake. That's the current state of our project. We don't have WordPress. We didn't pull down any plugins, themes, must use plugins, nothing. It's just the git ignore. And we even ignored our WP folder where WordPress will live because Composer cares about it. We have HTX test and index PHP so WordPress can live in a subdirectory and we got our composer.json file. As I said, what you see is what you get. That's WordPress now. I talked about the mastering environment, the uh, env files that Vance Lucas PHP dot environment. As you can imagine, when we have one package that we can distribute to, I don't say, uh, I don't know, let's say, 50 clients, and we push the same package with the same composer JSON and so on to every client, we still have different database credentials. We have different table names. We have, uh, I don't know, debug logging running on one side and we got a different user table name on another side and so on. We have to pull that out of our version control. And to do that, we have env files. This is just 
a key value storage, pretty much like you, you see in YAML or in, in uh, JSON files. It's absolutely easy. Key equals value, done. So you have another folder that you just push up your, your environmental files and you can use the same uh, install for different clients with different settings. Plus, it will never happen that you leak data. For some time you could search on GitHub for, for usernames and passwords and database credentials and you would get 15,000 results. Nice target. Reality check won't work because animated GIFs don't work in PDFs. Just assume you see a lot of command line foo going on here. Again, the current state of our project, we just have one more file. Of course, that is ignored by Git. I just put it there so you know we have one more file. The only two files we generated ourselves and th that change from project to project may be our composer JSON and every time the env file. Done. On the left hand side, this is our project, composer JSON, and it creates all that. No, there's no link here. I will have to search it up. As I said, you can use Compose a Script. And with Compose a Script, you can generate files, for example, like a wp-config.php uh, file. You can ask yourself, come on, what shall the database credentials are? Or do you want to have a different FTP setting in your wp-config or different caching setup or different cookie prefix, whatever? Write yourself a script, put it in there. Even better, on the right hand, uh, right lower side, there's link. I will put it up later on, and you can click the link and get to exactly this script here. And that exactly this wp-config command, as you might have guessed from the name, will create your WP, WP config file for you with asking you for input. And I wanted to show it here. Okay, the version game. That's pretty tricky. Let's say we have 10 dependencies, five plugins, one theme, four libraries. At one point, where two plugins require the same library, we'll have a conflict. What happens if plugin A requires version 1, plugin B requires version 1.1? You have to solve the conflict. If you use Git, uh, Git submodules, and you can still shoot yourself in the foot if you don't care about how you specify versions. And the version game is, unbound versions. When you open GitHub, any project, you will see a lot of stars. And stars are like, I don't give a fuck, just give it to me. And that will bring you the Russian roulette version, any version. Mostly it will be the latest on the master branch and so on. You don't want to do that. Next thing is dev minus or dash master that's always an unstable branch. If something is broken there, it will be broken on your side as well. So you just uh, inherited all the bugs. And the third thing is just not readable. It's great or equal version x dot x, but lower version epsilon. If you have a list of, I don't know, 50 dependencies, and you come back to your project half a year later and have to check all through this, you don't want to read that. Next thing, compose a lock. When you pull in changes, you generate a composer.log file. A lot of people just ignore that because, I mean, it's auto-generated, it just tells me, okay, those versions were installed. But like with the shared boxes from Vagrant, that's absolutely equal, we will commit the composer log file. So everybody who pulls in our project and installs it, we are composer, 
will have the exact same versions. If we got a problem and a bug and things break, and they often break and always break, it breaks for everybody and we can work on something together. If there is a patch release, like let's say we don't fix it in our project, we pulled in a dependency that just killed it off and we looked at the code and said, oh, hey, let's go to GitHub, this guy made this and that wrong. We push up a patch, we make a pull request, it gets pulled in, gets a new tag, and we just move one version forward so we can pull all that back. Again, we commit composer JSON, we commit composer lock. Everybody else in the team pulls stuff in and the stuff is fixed for everybody. So always commit your composer lock. And the second thing is pretty small here, that's a tilde, like this sign. That means give me this specific version plus all minor versions. Or if you specify a minor version like 2.0, then you get 2.0 plus patches. And you will likely always use the tilde operator with major plus minor version because patch means something broke, something got fixed. Power. Next funny tool. Again, it's the asset manager for styles, scripts, and you obviously don't want to use that in your main project. I said, put every plugin, every theme in a single repository. Those are your own dependencies. You can pull in from private repositories, no problem. Pull it in, and if you manage, let's say, uh, underscore or Twitter bootstrap, then you pull it in, we are power. All those package managers are really great at solving conflicts for you. They are really great in, in lowering the impact on file size. You have very little repositories with very little code. We're the stage in web development where we mostly configure things. We don't ne have to necessarily code things up. A lot of people coded things up for us. We just have to pull them in and match them up against each other. Bower has, again, like most of the, the, the package managers, a configuration file, it's a little bit special because it got a Bower RC file, this is the configuration file for Bower itself, and then we got the Bower JSON that tells us where to find repositories and where to pull in, them in from. So the Bower RC is the file where we specify our target directory. Again, exactly the same thing as you have seen with Composer, it's really easy. Then we have a timeout and Really? Yeah. Okay. Power is great, just use it. <laughs> Power install, exactly the same. Dependencies, development dependencies, and WP content, themes, awesome theme. This is where Power installs, and we defined it. Style CSS, functions, PHP, Power JSON. That's your whole theme for now. Next thing, development, test, and deploy. I told you about NPM, I guess it's the next slide, yeah. That's for task runners and asset pipelines. We got a lot of different stuff like Maven, Java already had that in, I don't know, 2000, and Ruby games, Python tools. We have the new stuff with Grant, Gout, Cake, Broccoli, Cake, whatever. There are approximately a thousand things out there. I personally use Grant. And NPM comes again with a package JSON file. Um, it got a name. You can use dependencies, development dependencies, and again, like with Composer, scripts. You want to use that. You want to automatically, I don't know, shrink file sizes, remove metadata. You want to concatenate your style sheets and your script files. And you want to minify it and uglify it. And this is how, how our plugin would now look and it would install all the funny stuff into node modules and so on. And, rip. yeah, really important. We have the time for that. Don't install anything globally. Composer, pull down composer.far, put it in your repo. If someone hasn't installed Composer globally, he has the same thing and he has the same version. You can really shoot yourself in the foot if your colleague got a different Composer version than you do. Comment that as well. Don't install anything globally. Install it per project. 
configure the location where you want to install it from, from the JSON file, just pull it in. Grunt is a preprocessor. It does stuff like uglifying, minifying, concatenating, and so on. That's not really the most interesting stuff. Yeah, you can save your client requests and so on. But uh, yeah. OK, I have to go one step back. Uh, that's my basic um, grunt file. Module.export is function, and it has grunt as argument. So in here, we have grunt available, require everything very simple. We just throw in grunt as argument everywhere, and I have four things going on. First thing is a grunt plugin for autoloading grunt tasks that execute minifying, concatenating, and so on. Then we have time grunt. That's very important because if your build process gets very slow, then you know where. You don't have to think about it. You exactly know. That's the problem. I will fix this. Last thing, grunt, uh, grunt config, load grunt config is splitting grunt tasks up. This makes it incredibly um, replaceable and, and you can port it from one project to the next one. So you really want to, to just copy paste that one. Last thing, watch tasks. You hit grunt watch on the command line and uh, everything, every time you change a file, it rebuilds, it runs all the tasks and re it, it rebuilds your files and you don't have to, uh, to do things manually anymore and you get it locked. Like this thing changed there because of that. That's it. Yeah. Simple, readable in, in six months. Again, it's not always or only about making things easier for you because you now use a package manager or you use Vagrant. It's also easier because you can come back to something and still understand it. Custom JSON config, let's drop that one. Quality control, very important. That's maybe the most important thing. When you use asset pipelines like Grunt or Task Runners, you have your less file. You need to pre-process that to CSS. You, you need to combine all your pre-processed files to one style file. You need to minify it, and then you got one small final file. Less becomes CSS. We got a cache folder, so it got then minified, and then it gets concatenated with all the other CSS files, and we got our style.min.css file. Really important thing, think out a very, very clever folder structure. It's not about coding, it's about organizing your stuff. Every step can just break, and when it breaks, it breaks horribly. And you won't be able to just find out where it broke, so we will get back in and try to use just the raw CSS files, or just the minified, or just the final file. So take all the lint and hint stuffs uh, tasks that will tell you this broke because of that. It didn't work in that step. Don't start manually debugging with a shotgun, going through one file, the next file, uporting here or there. There are tools for that. Quality control tools. Use them between every single step. If you have to repeat them, repeat them. The same is possible for PHP files. You got code sniffer, mass detector, you got unit tests. If you thought that isn't possible for you to use it because you ain't got the time and the project is too small, that's not true. You can really do it with Git hooks. Like with all the, the, the dependency manager stuff. It's very simple to run stuff before something happens, when something happens, or after something happens. So you got pre-commit hooks, everything that's written in there will happen when you hit git commit this and that. Everything. And then you just run something like a mess detector and it goes through one after the next file and says, hey, come on, you forgot the semicolon. Or, I don't know, you got one function with 900 files. So don't try to do this on WordPress core. They won't work but it will work on your own code and it will help you to write better code and not commit crap that don't work. Yep, I guess we're over. Okay. So last thing, 
automate everything, use Git hooks, use all the JSON, funky magic, use dependency managers, it's really, really easy. You just have to make that one single step. And don't be afraid of it. On the command line, you can break everything. It doesn't matter. You won't kill your whole machine. You will maybe, maybe kill one fake Ubuntu install on your hard disk. It won't even break for the rest of your team. Just play around with it. Use PuffBet, use Composer, use NPM and Bower. Just do it tomorrow. It will take you one hour and will wonder why you always invested, I don't know, five hours just to set up the base for a project when you could have done the same thing in five minutes. And the same thing is written in a very wise sentence. Life begins at the end of your comfort zone. If you don't feel comfortable with it, that's exactly the reason to do it. Okay, that's me. Save that. Twitter it. Thank you. <laughs>